Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of a suitable agency at Sundar Nursery to a wonderful new session of suitable conversations at Sundar Nursery. This series of conversations was first inspired by our love for all things books, and a suitable agency is extremely grateful to everyone at Suitable Nursery for their support and encouragement in making this happen. There would be no suitable conversations without them. And now for the event we've been waiting for. Akhil Katyal is a writer, translator, and scholar based in Delhi. He is the author of Like Blood on the Bitten Tongue, Delhi Poems, and How Many Countries Does Indus Cross? With Aditi Angiras, he co-edited The World That Belongs to Us, an anthology of queer poetry from South Asia. He translated Ravish Kumar's Ishq Me Sheher Hona as a city happens in love. He has held the International Writing Fellowship at the University of Iowa and the Vijay Nandisan Poetry Fellowship at Sangam House. He coordinates the creative writing program at Avedkar University, Delhi. Aditi Rao is the author of The Finger Remembers and A Kind of Freedom Song. Her essays and poems have been published widely and her work has been recognized by several awards and fellowship, fellowships including the Hedge Hedgebrook Residency, the Sangam House Writers Residency, the Srinivas Rayprol Prize for Poetry, the TFA Creative Writing and English Award, amongst others. She has taught creative and research writing while also working in the youth development and education sectors for over a decade. Aditi is currently working on the Daughters Project, a collection of oral histories of women across India who were raised by single women, which is proudly represented by a suitable agency. Thank you both for being a part of Suitable Conversations. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here on this really busy Saturday in the cultural calendar of the city. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with Akhil, who is a fellow poet, a fellow teacher of creative writing, and a dear, dear friend. I think many of these... Um, themes, things that we're going to talk about today are things I've had the good fortune to be in conversation with Akhil about over the years. And I wanted to, Akhil, start from thinking about, you know, we're, before we talk about queer poetry, about queerness itself. I think over the years I've learned a lot from you about queerness and poetry and queer poetry. And one of the things that has always really stood out for me and how you think about it is the ways in which your definitions, your ideas about queerness are always more about how to include than whom to exclude. And I was thinking, you know, in your, um, in the doubleness of sexuality, which is Akhil's uh, sort of a reworking of his PhD thesis, um, where he does some theoretical thinking about sexuality and queerness, um, you talk about the early years of queer activism with Nigah, and you talk about this division that emerged over the years between what you call the queer wallas and the LGBT wallas. So maybe let's start by laying that framework for how you think about queerness in terms of not just identity, but also worldview. Uh, thank you, Aditi. Uh, thank you to everyone who's come here. Uh, and feel free to later on in this conversation to join in any doubts, hesitations, questions, thoughts that you'd like to share later. And this is the question that we have sort of planned to begin to outline the conversation that we'll have today. You know, when I was uh, in the early years of this century, when I was in my undergraduate uh, education at Delhi University, one was constantly encountering very two very different definitions of queer. Uh, there was one set which was very much about, okay, who you desire determines who you are. So let's say if I like women, I am straight. If I like men, I am gay. And that was very much about the body that I inhabited, the desires that that body had, the direction of that desire. And some people qualified as queer by that standard, and obviously many others did not qualify. But at the same time, as a young undergraduate student, lots of other like, signals were also being bombarded on us about what queer is. And that was, at that point, my queer elders were telling me that the way to think about it is something else altogether. It's not about which bodies are queer and which bodies are not queer. But there seems to be a charmed circle of some sort. Some, NGO, some NGOs called it Jadui Ghera. 
uh, in the 70s, the feminists called it the charmed circle. Uh, we, uh, in the early years of this queer group called Niga, we called it the circle of intersectionality. But there seemed to be a charmed circle inside of which were those relationships which were socially accepted, which sort of formed the fantasy, the core of what is socially accepted. And those happened to be cross-gender, heterosexual relationships in which the man is slightly older, slightly taller, earns a little more, uh, same caste, same religion. And those seem to be occupying that which is accepted by all, which define what the grain of social success is. And those people who were outside this charmed circle, outside this jadui ghera, were people who did not qualify on one count or the other. Right? They might be having an inter-caste relationship, they might be a single woman who's not in a relationship, who's navigating adoption. There might be an inter-religious relationship, which over the years, over the subsequent years, would be vilified as love jihad. There might be various kinds of relationship, which are outside the circle, which were just as queer. And now queer was against the social grain of things. Uh, you know, my English literature training tells me, in Chaucer, early English writer, in Chaucer, the phrase is, there's nobody as queer as folk, which means there's nobody as strange as people. And this strange was not about, do you like men, do you like women? But this strange was that we are against the grain of social acceptance. We are against, we are in some kind of friction with social acceptance. And we are either joyously or morbidly failing at what the social standard is. That definition of queerness seduced one, seduced the people we were, that I was working with, that I was thinking with, that I was writing with. And I think ultimately whether one was writing poetry, whether one was ed editing anthologies, whether one was speaking about queer writing, the latter definition, where then not just those who are LGBT, but this wider definition of queer seemed to lay a bigger and bigger claim over the years. And and the way one was writing and imagining also tallied with that. The other thing about thinking about queerness in the subcontinent is people who write about same-sex desire or same-sex love or same-sex relationships, people who write about it are not dependent on the terms such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. So, for instance, Isma Chiktai has written about it, Surikant Tripathi Nirala has written about it, Amar Kant has written about it, Kamleshwar has written about it, but when they are writing, they are writing in one sense without these identity markers. They are writing through the idioms of uh, lat, inke, inko to nawabi shock hai, uh, inko ye aadat lag gai hai, uh, logo ko uh, paan khate to paan bazi ka shock hai, uh, daru pite to daru bazi ka shock hai, inko londe bazi ka shock hai. So the languages that were being used, the idioms that were being used were distinct. And you see it from Pandey Bechan Sharma, Ukra, Hindi writer in the 1920s, to Isma Chuktai, who wrote, as most of us know, Lihaf in the early 1940s, which was slapped with an obscenity case. So, in the subcontinent, there are just so many, both within the activist milieu, in which I encountered during early years of uh, undergraduate years, and in the literature that one was reading in Hindi and Urdu, languages of queerness spilled over just... LGBT. So then one's thinking and one's writing also map that spilling over. Yeah. And so for those of you who don't know, Akhil and Aditi Angiras um, co-edited a couple of years ago this anthology of uh, queer South Asian poetry called the, the World That Belongs to Us. And I remember um, you write about it in the preface as well. And that whole process when the first kind of call for submissions went out, and a lot of thought and care had gone into trying to make that call really inclusive and encompassing and uh, open-ended. And we also discovered, you also discovered that a lot of people wanted to expand it further, felt like it didn't fully um, encompass their identities. Um, and there were also some really interesting conversations you write about in this preface of how certain other identities intersecting with, for instance, a gender identity, like, you know, somebody saying, it's important to me that you use the indigenous term for trans woman from my community and don't identify me as a trans woman from the Northeast, mm -hmm. right? So it's not obviously just 
I mean, identity is so big, right? And it's not just one or the other. And in a sense, folks were pushing back with this intersectionality that uh, that you talked about uh, aiming for. So do you want to talk a little bit about that in the context of what you discovered, what you learned about what queer poetry and what queerness in the context of the literary landscape is? Yeah. In fact, may I borrow uh, the book just to refer to one particular line? Sorry. You know, one of the things that I discovered when editing Aditi Yangiras and I, when we were editing this anthology called The World That Belongs to Us, queer, an anthology of queer poetry in South Asia, is that these editor types, they never have the confidence of their cover pages. So they might make certain promises and claims on their cover pages, whereas the content of the book itself is militating against it, spilling over it, uh, doing strange things to it, qualifying it in some respect or the other. So on the cover, we said an anthology of queer poetry. Right. But inside the book, there was far something far more chaotic, something far more interesting happening uh, in the uh, and queer then itself. You know, at one time it became this in, in one sense, it was a phantasmatic word. It threw the net so wide that anyone and everyone could be caught within it in a sense. But it was also a convenience because lots of people in the anthology did not necessarily think of themselves as queer or where queer was the primary stakes of their identity in the world. There were several other ways in which they entered, or even the words that they would use would be uh, gay, lesbian, trans woman, uh, hijra, kothi, aravani, jogappa, meili chele, and etc, etc. Several words were making these claims. And so we thought when we will send out the call to make that call as inclusive as possible, little did we realize there was much more left to be done even after that call was sent. So I'll just read out the call that we had Aditi Angiras and I had initially sent out when we were trying to put out put together this anthology. We sent it out about six to seven languages, but this is what we had written. We had invited entries from trans men, trans women, lesbian, hijra, kothi, gay, aravani, khwaja sara, intersex, jogappa, Bisexual, drag king, queen, genderqueer, non-binary, male chele, butch, femme, and other poets. And to be honest, at that point, no matter how, uh, in retrospect, however it sounds, we thought we were being sufficiently inclusive and Catholic. But what we realized is at that very moment when this call sent out in the world, there are several people who said, but wait a minute, what about asexuals? Wait a minute, what about pansexual folks? Wait a minute, what about allies? Wait a minute, what about diaspora for those people who thought of their regional connection to South Asia more important than just their sexual uh, commonality? There were folks, uh, Ramki, for instance, from Chennai told us, but wait a minute, you have not said anything about Nupi Manba and uh, Nupi Manbi, which are indigenous Métis trans identities from Manipur, uh, so did, and, and put us in touch with Santa Kurai, who finally contributed to the book. Uh, folks from Chennai said, Tirunanga is missing entirely from your call of... Uh, that you've sent out into the world. So at that point, we realized, you know, that people who otherwise we are using this umbrella term called queer, but people actually live out their emotional and social lives under a maddeningly complex slew of identities, uh, names, gestures, signals, which are important to them and through which they transact their emotional lives. Uh, so that, for instance, was kind of an education into humility, of course, but also an education into that this queerness, this thing, this which is allowing uh, the engine of the book to sort of be kickstarted, is actually uh, is actually a, con a, a matter of convenience and a matter of editorial uh, uh, put togetherness, rather than having signposting in any way how people actually lived out their life, what moves them affectively, what names they are using for each other, or the people that they love and have affection for. So. That's something that one was then, and one of the things that told us is that when we asked people for their bios as well, we allowed them to write whatever they wished, rather than have a template, tell us your sexuality, tell us your regional, tell us your publication history, rather than having a template for their bios, we just said, you tell us how, what you want to write about you. And there's some people who eschewed identity altogether. There's some people who talked far more about their regional belonging rather than their sexual identity which told us that sexuality itself is like a Janus-faced, 
multi uh, tentacle thing and that uh, queer poetry what we were putting together is not only going to be about the direction of your desire but it's going to be all dimensions of life that queer people espouse and hold important in their lives you no know? so that's something that aditi angiras and i very quickly realized after the call went out into the world and yeah i think part of that is that realizing or that rediscovering that people's identities around sexuality and gender were one part of and it, and often a lens into a lot of their lives but so were many other things right like so was being indigenous so being speak writing in a particular language or being from a particular caste location um and i think we've talked about this also in this idea of like what queer poetry is that it can at first glance for a lot of people seem like um primarily poetry that writes about sexuality but is that the only thing that queer poetry is and i'm going to read out like a few questions that you raise in this um in in your preface and ask you uh to reflect on those uh, both through sharing and through reading a couple of the poems here um so you say what is a queer poem years ago when one of us had posed a similar question to hoshang merchant he had given us a series of answers some of which contradicted each other anthologists never have the confidence of their cover page not even half of it is a queer poem written by a queer identified person about queer themes whatever those may be can a non queer person not address those themes as well can a queer person writing about cooking or mars or landlords or taking a dump in the morning also qualify as a queer poem after all these are all also dimensions of a life of that person or do only themes of protest anger love loss gender loneliness body joy sexuality desire qualify as queer poems we have had different answers to these questions at different points we all turned out to be both an embodied experience available to some people but also a disembodied stance towards the world wielded by many and i think we are back to that idea that we started with here also of queerness not just as an identity but also as a world view and also as um a lens through which many things are happening in a life so do you want to just think more about that question of what is a queer for oh uh... Yeah in fact it might be interesting to go back i mean before this anthology came out there were several other anthologies which paved the way for it and although i see uh, some people belong to the age group where they would be well aware of what i was speaking about but there were several others who were born around that year uh, so 1999 was actually a very crucial publishing moment in indian publishing regarding what we can now think in retrospect as queer publishing you know it was 1999 and 2000 it was the year where three very instrumental books came out one was ashwini sukthankar's facing the mirror lesbian writing from india the other was yarana gay writing from india edited by hoshang merchant with whom the conversation is mentioned in what aditi just read out and a year after from macmillan in india from what i remember uh ruthvanita and salim kidwai same sex love in indian history and literature had come out so you know as a when i was doing my doctoral work i was thinking about what this moment meant to those people who were editing these collections and so one turns up to the queen bee and to the saint of queer literature one went to hyderabad spent extensive number of days with hoshang merchant who lived on this beautiful seventh floor apartment in masab tank uh, and i asked him so what was your criteria for including people in an anthology which you are calling yarana gay writing from india and the thing about long conversations is they reveal contradictions rather than clear answers on one day he would say one thing on the other day he would reverse that thing uh and these conversations in one leg happened over 3 days and another leg happened over 4 days so in one instance he would give us a very clear answer oh, what is gay writing gay writing is when gay people write about gay experiences clear enough it seemed that there was a limited template of what Uh, gay writing meant and the editor was doing the work to include it but then on another instance he also talked me to me about that in the late 90s there were actually very slim pickings on what could be included into this collection of gay writing in one instance he said when so for instance when he was asking aga shahed ali the kashmiri american poet 
to be included in this anthology he had there's actually very pathos written correspondence where hoshang is writing these extensive letters to hoshang uh, to shahid who was there in amherst massachusetts uh, in the in that decade and there were very curt replies one line replies from shahid zain who finally refused to be in the anthology but when hoshang spoke to shahid as a potential contributor he was speaking about it as a gay volume and in one sense you have to come out as gay if you want to be included in this volume but in the same instance the same editor when he was getting in touch with let's say a punjabi writer such as gyan singh shatir hoshang told me at that point i didn't tell him ye gay she and i'm quoting him he said he maine usko ye gay she nahi bataya maine usko bataya dosti ke bare mein hai volume aur aap apni kahani hame do and in that sense he out shatir the shatir he sort of uh, in one sense got his work without in one sense telling him what the primary mandate of the book was or for instance and in another instance someone like firaq gorakhpuri who uh, uh, several works have now attested and several biographical vignettes have now attested was this kind of spillover figure of libertinage and uh, sexual excess and kind of sodomitical fantasies uh, in uh, north india of the mid 20th century firaq gorakhpuri uh, gorakhpuri uh, uh, pen name for agupati sahai but Hoshan says the strange things that he said he was an avowed homosexual but he never wrote a gay line and for the moment i scratched my head when i was writing my book, what does this mean this medical biological term called homosexual he is but this cultural social thing called gay he isn't so this told me that there is indeed a slippage between it that there is no self avowed self identified gayness which firaq gorakhpuri uh, worked with so finally hoshang translated one of his poems which seemed to be about well and this is a very apposite setting because that poem was about bushes and what happens behind bushes so and he translated that poem as a poem which can be included in a volume of gay writing so what it told me that the editorial process is a messy process the claim of the cover page gay writing included within it several kind of counter claims and things which contradicted it so no simple story emerged and hosh and the finally the poems for instance i have, i don't think i have time to read them but finally the poems that we included of hoshang merchant in our volume about uh about 20 years later after his penguin volume were one poem where you read hoshang well lusting after a sindhi boy and another poem where he is writing about the loss of his sister and rather than treat one as a queer poem because it is about the direction of desire and attraction and love and the other poem as if not queer because it's about a loss of a sibling we chose to treat these two aspects of hoshang life as just dimensions of queerness that after all one is very explicitly about attraction but the other one is also about love for a sister who's now going away uh, outside the pale of mortality she's dying but the love for that sister who one sense was a very crucial presence in his life and stood in solidarity and support to him as against family family's refusal to accept him on certain terms so rather than treat one as queer and the other as rather than treat hoshang as lover as a as opposite for a queer volume and hoshang as brother as not within the fold of queerness we chose to include both and hence gave the gift of complexity to lies which are otherwise were, are not allowed that gift where they either both whether you are celebrating them or vilifying them are fetishized as as if those lives are composed only of and as if people are only the sum of their desires surely people are that and much more right yeah and we were also um, talking a little bit about this in your work just before i asked you to read a little bit we were talking about it also as um over the whatever 20 years or so that you've been writing and thinking about poetry um in a way there's been some shifts in those thematics as well right which are also shifts in the preoccupations or the central concerns perhaps of of a given time in one's life um and the ways in which you know i remember around the time i first met you this is pre uh, decriminalization and there were some of those 37 i want to 377 you so bad kind of poems that um i heard you reading more of and over time it kind of grew into like uh, one of the poems which i asked you to read that i really love the aligarh poem which is sort of 
a reflection, I mean, still very much a reflection on what it means to be a gay man, what it means to be queer in this in this world we live in. But it's a very different reflection. It's um, it's also an older reflection in many ways. Um, so is there something you'd like to kind of think about in terms of, you know, within even your own life and poetry, the dimensions that take center stage of queerness and therefore of queer poetry and how they've kind of moved and shifted over time and maybe read us some of your work as part of that joke. Uh, in answering that question, you know, one of the two phrases that I'll use, which might be, these are really tricky classroom phrases. We are, I'm also a teacher at Ambedkar University. And one of the words, one of the sets of words which we constantly bandy about in the classroom is synchronic and diachronic. What it simply means is, as several of us know, Synchronic is that at one moment of time, diachronic is over a long period of time, let's say some something over one's lifetime. What I realized about queerness is that it functioned very differently synchronically and diachronically. Then at some point in your life, and for me those years were let's say end of school life and the beginning of like doctoral work, so somewhere in the late teen years till mid twenties, queerness was everything there was. Queerness was because it had been, since till that point, it had been a subject of fear, subject of anxiety, subject which bullies uh, treated you in a certain manner for, uh, subject of secrecy. And the great thing about secrecy is it makes you think very disproportionately about yourself. You think that which you are hiding is the most important thing about you. But what happened later on, as this initial intensity faded off, what happened is that it, queerness became one of the many things that you occupy in the world one of the many things that you identify in the world. And then even the way you were thinking about queer community was not just people who share the same uh, bodily desires as me as belonging to the queer community, but at that point, uh, let's say, let's say an Amrita Pritam or a Dorothy Parker were just as queer for me as an Aga Shahid Ali was. In what sense? You know, uh, Dorothy Parker, for some of you might have read her work, uh, Dorothy Parker was a woman who lived by herself, who had the peculiar honor, which some people write as a queer honor, of dying alone in her room. Uh, someone who experienced love and loss and wrote about it with a great sense of sometimes compromise and sometimes celebration. And when she died, she did not let her estate go in the patrilineal direction to her sons and daughters in a sense. But she uh, first... Uh, donated it to Martin Luther King Jr. And then when um, Martin Luther King died, it went to the NAACP. So that figure who wrote about loneliness and uh, desire and love and loss was as much a queer figure for me as, let's say, someone like Amrita Pritam who had the longest unmarried relationship with the lover. And there's this one instance where, uh, I think, middle of the 20th century, no, uh, independent India, uh, Sajjad Zaheer, who used to work then in the All India Radio, a group of Punjabi writers come to him and the contingent from AIR was going to go to Moscow uh, for a literary meet. And at that point, this bunch of Punjabi writers said that our wives have told us, and it's, it's won't of men to blame their wives for most things. He said, our wives have told us that if Amrita goes, they're not allowing, they won't allow us to go with them on this Russian trip. And at that point, Amrita said, well, I don't care two hoots about this. And she did go to Moscow. But this Amrita Pritam throughout her life and the kind of literary reception she had in that moment considered someone who was breaking the protocols of what good womanhood was. Someone thought to have loose morals. Then in one sense also lived this unmarried life with a lover in a house in Delhi. These figures were just as important, inspirational, uh, significant figures rather than someone with whom one may share uh, this thing called gayness or this thing called lesbianness. So, and that was when queerness was no longer a thorn in your shoe which was pinching you. And that was a short moment in your life where it was indeed that. But soon it just became one of the many things which you always have. You know, that it was no longer a limit to you, it was one of your dimensions. Uh, and it also made you realize that that thing which we think is not queer is also other dimensions. Like, for instance, people people also write white literature and heterosexual literature and upper caste literature, but they are usually not named as such because some some attributes are given the limitation of being a constraint and some attributes are considered universal. 
one began to question that distinction. Uh, so if you want, I could read out a few poems and maybe... Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So I'll read out a few poems which actually engage with a bunch of things that we have said so far. And again, whatever comes to your mind later on, one will be free to engage, or one will be happy to engage with that. Let's start with a love poem. Yeah. Hamare Beat. Hamare Beat, Rat Rani ki Ladiya, Kache Sone ki Chadar, Rasbari ki Khatas, Kach ka Jangla. Hamare Beat, Paslo ki Dohar. Chikni mitti ki divar, ananas ke kaate, shajaha ki guhar. Hamare beach, kuch nahi ka pani, amrita ki aas, bijli ka dastak, ginti ki baat. Hamare beach, akhir ki raat, jamna ki kalik, til ki seedi, ul ka paat. Uh, Amrita Ki Aas is obviously a reference to uh, Amrita Pritha who we were speaking about. This next poem was uh, one of the writers that I have come to admire uh, a great deal and it all often enters the classroom discussions that we have as well is Krishna Sotti. And I was reading, uh, no, I was attending actually a durational uh, reading that uh, Anuradha Kapoor had designed and it was being done in the Anglo-Arabic school at Ajmeri Gate. And in Saida Hamid's voice is when I first heard this line, you know, one of the characters, if I remember her name correctly, and I'll blame myself if I don't, Mehek, I think, is telling in the novel to her lover, not her married lover, who she, he is married to Kutum, another woman, but he's telling her lover, Kripa Narayan, ki mujhe itna barik na hai ki hamari jaan par bana hai. And that line, with its peculiar claim and vulnerability at the same time, sort of stuck by me, and I tried to translate it. But there was no one contender of translation which was winning out. So I tried to translate it in as many ways as possible. And this poem is called 12 Variations on a Sopti Line. Itna barik na sutiye ki hamari jaan par banaye. Do not thresh me so thin that I die. Do not cut me so sharp that I break. Do not braid me so fine that I sigh. Do not shear me so close that I ache. Do not press me so hard that I paper. Do not knit me so tight that I tear. Do not sear me so far that I vapor. Do not draw me so red that I scare. Do not crush me so muslin that I fly. Do not burn me so ash that I winter. Do not spin me so cunning that I cry. Do not shard me so hot that I splinter. The uh, I urge you to I mean pick up the Lo Danish by Krishna so if some of you haven't. Uh, the next poem was I think this next poem will be very much a front and center gay poem in any gay anthologist verse. This is the one which belongs to that kind of narrow definition of uh, queerness. This poem is about dating as a man in one's thirties. Meeting new men. In the first meeting, I want to give them three lilacs, one stapler, and a picture of a giraffe. Basically, to say it's okay to be confused, it will take some work figuring each other out. Can we take it slow? This way, I will know the ones who stay holding these oddities in their hands without dropping them can take uncertainty. A small dose every day and still phone to say good night. At our age, we are no longer gifts to each other. We are labor come in different colors. We have each had our past desiccated, but lived to eat pie in the summer. We each lived a little lie that we have told no one. We've been wronger than we had imagined we would be. Do you see? Come, look at this giraffe craning his neck to look on the other side of the sun. Didn't we all think we'd be stronger? Will you stay? Will you stay long enough to want to stay longer? And the next poem, which I thought was my hat tip to Hoshang Merchant's Sindhi Boy poem, it's a poem of acute lust. 
Uh, and the epigraph is from Denise Riley. It says, if my exquisite hope can wrench you right back. It's for G, one evening returned from work. Is there anything more beautiful than helmet pressed hair? Once it's off, his forehead is such a snack. I could munch down that black confection falling over his eyes. Those thumb press curls, that yum sort of waviness that the little crushes in his hair tells me this dude is dude about town, wears his sweat and dust. His motorcycle sort of musk like a grungy crown, street smart, world-wise, safe when he has to be, stuntman and on his off days. Come on, lay him out on a pan and feed the needy. Touch his hair, climb those steps, reach the highs. That boyishness, that unmade hair gives him his let's not mince words paradise. So beer drink him, seat him, greet him, then eat him, glass clink him, chop lick him. Try him, pry him, open hair, flick him, down dick him, let him rest, then lipstick him, tie him, dry him, sleep. Next day, pillion ride and fly him. So, these would be the usual contenders, no? Like in one sense, these are poems about love, affection, circuits of dating, desire. And yet, Love and desire are not always front and center in everyone's life. Different things make claims on you at different points in your life. There are other things which, after all, queer people are not just people who love and desire all their life. They also have, they also have to houses to live in, plumbers to call, uh, repairs to make, landlords to appease. And at that moment, I was thinking about, and then you do not live in this fantasy that there's something unique about queerness, because at that moment, in fact, for me, at this point, as a 38-year-old 30, gay man, I will have in the kind of, but otherwise affluent, English-speaking, uh, upper caste, there's a one way in which, let's say, just the tenancy market, the rent, landlord's market will treat me in a certain manner. But let's say a perfectly heterosexual married inter-caste couple or an inter-religious couple will have a far more hard time than me to get a house. So just thinking about that, and at that point, it also unseats queer people from, and certainly queer people from otherwise privileged social locations from thinking that they're special. And then I'll wrap up after these two poems. It's a poem called, and I'm sure a lot of you will recognize parts of you in it, Delhi Me Ghar Dhoonna, right? So think of all the brokers and landlords you've ever interacted with. Delhi Me Ghar Dhoonna. Kitne log rahenge? हम सिंगल लोगों को घर नहीं देते सिर्फ फैमिलीज को नहीं मकान मालिक ज्यादा रोक टोक नहीं करता बस नॉन वेज और अल्कोहल नहीं जैन है ना इतना तो बनता है अरे वो तो मुसलमानों का एरिया है कंजेस्टेड है एक के ऊपर एक आप मुस्लिम के घर रह लेंगे देखिए ग्राउंड फ्लोर आसानी से नहीं मिलता यहाँ ठीक है सब पंजाबी है पूरा वेंटिलेशन है नहीं बैचुलर लोग न्यूसेंस करते हैं ना नहीं आप नहीं वैसे कह रहा हूँ आप कहा के हैं क्या करते हैं नाम नहीं नहीं पूरा नाम एंड दिस लास्ट पोएम आई विच मे बी आई कैन क्लोज विद इज अ पोएम विच आई रोट फॉर डॉक्टर सिरस डॉक्टर रामचंद्र श्रीनिवास सिरस विट लोट ऑफ यू विल रिकॉल वॉज अ टीचर ऑफ मराठी इन ए एम यू टिल टिल अबाउट थर्टीन ईयर्स अगो वेन you know these two i the poem makes that evident and i won't belabor it what you already recall but towards the end of his life after the suspension from a view one of the hardest things that he had is to find a house in aligarh to live and i was just thinking about that moment between siras as a man who was if i remember correctly in his 50s trying to find a house that lay in that late stage and trying to make a sense a renewed relationship with this city after this ignominy of that suspension, right? Aligarh. On 8th February 2010, two men forced their way into Dr. Ramchandra Siras' house and shot a video of him in bed with another man. The next day, Siras, a professor of Marathi literature, was suspended by AMU for gross misconduct. The courts ruled against the university, giving Siras his job back. On 7th April that year, Cyrus died in a rented apartment under mysterious circumstances, a day before the official letter revoking his suspension arrived at his office. 
Dr. Siras, in those nights, you must have felt loneliness like a drip. The walls of your room held together by a faint song, past loves sitting by you, combing the hours. That poem, Dr. Siras, where you ask the beloved moon not to fear the dawn that separates us, where you seek consolation even from shadows, I read it last night on the terrace. It held my hands. We will dance as shadows dance. It let grass grow under my feet. We will touch as shadows touch. It hurt my morning into dewdrops. Dr. Siras, in, in my Delhi Barsati, the windows open onto a palash tree. I was 27 when I first moved into it. The landlord did not pause at the word bachelor. He only asked if I had too many parties. I didn't. I got the house. But next time, Dr. Siras, when I look for a place in the city, I'll be older. I was born the year you got your PhD. And they'll pause at marriage. And I will try to draw respect from a right surname, from saying teacher, from telling them my birthplace, and will try and hide my feelings small under my feet. You had said you were always unseen in the light of day. What did you say, Dr. Siras, when you looked for that house in Durgawadi? What did you tell the neighbors? Teacher? Professor? Poet? What gives us this respect, Dr. Siras, this contract with water? In those nights, weighing this word in your hands, you must have felt weak. You must have closed the windows to keep out the evening. You must have looked back and hung the song in the air between refusal and letting go. Thank you. I think before we open up uh, to the audience, one last um, thing that maybe you can read that home at the end of the Q&A, but just to sort of open that conversation towards that we were talking about a little while ago was, so far we've kind of looked at queerness and queer poetry more in themes of one's own lived experience, right? Um, but you also, like, especially in uh, how many countries does the Indus cross, you're kind of reckoning with larger political, geopolitical, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, like a lot of big questions that um, fall within that very broad ambit of queerness, not in the narrow one at all. And I was just wondering if you want to say anything and then, you know, you also have um, in the new manuscript that you're working on some of these poems that are, for example, dealing with the pandemic, right? which um, there is now a queer lens on the world, right? It's um, not not all of those poems are about people who have lives like our own, like you have a poem to the soldier in Siachin, right? Uh, which is a very different life experience. So they're not in that sense autobiographical poems at all. But um, I know that for you, queerness as a worldview, as a lens, as a way of looking, is still sort of very central to those poems. So maybe if they're too long to read, you can just read a short excerpt or something or just talk about like that that gesture of queerness in poetry. In one sense, this question relates to what we've been saying so far. But you know, long ago I was reading this, um, this uh, writer called Stuart Kellogg and, uh, and he said that, you know, Anyone, and it's not true only for queer folks, but anyone who has been kept out of one or the other kind of social mainstream develops a high degree of sensitivity to the ways or workings of that mainstream. So there is where some people, no matter that the initial gesture might that be of exclusion, but once excluded, they develop a kind of heightened scrutiny of those who are excluding them. And uh, whether you read Professor Gopal Guru when he thinks it, of this in terms of caste, or whether you read uh, Kellogg, who thinks of it in terms of queerness, there is a way in which the ways of the world come up for particular scrutiny by queer folks, by the very virtue of them being excluded uh, from one point of celebration or another point of celebration of that world. So, and uh, there is a 
the the poems that Aditi was referring to, and I'll have time only to read one of them, and maybe I can close with that. Uh, for instance, you know, when I was thinking about as as you know, there's a there's a war which is older than me, uh, Siachen, continuous war. It 1984 it starts, and often as in our history books and in our uh, 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 school lessons, we were told with great kind of uh, 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 a significant amount of chest thumping that you know it's a it's the highest battleground in the world. And there's a way in which we looked in awe at that description of the war. But what we didn't realize is that that which is being celebrated as bravery and that which is being celebrated as the fortitude of the Indian soldier safeguarding us on our borders lets us not see that that same soldier then, because of the egregious weather conditions of that battlefield, also faces a set of issues when that soldier comes back. Uh, there's nothing like the long-term health deterioration which the soldiers in Siachen face once they are back in the mainstream, once they are back on the back in the plains where they belong to, or once they are back in the uh, Western Ghats and the Deccan. And then there is almost as if the soldier is a dead end. And at that point, there is no vocabulary for speaking about the experiences of that soldier because now that soldier is exhibiting quote unquote weakness, quote unquote uh, vulnerability. And I was just thinking. As a queer person, one was very sensitive to the heightened claims of masculinity. One was very sensitive to heightened claims of that which was thought as hardened manhood. And I saw that that soldier in Siachen, straight or gay, queer or not, was nonetheless having to live to an ideal of masculinity, which was an ideal which was also thrown at queer people's doorstep very uh, regularly. So maybe I'll end by a poem which, you know, Aditi is calling the non-autobiographical which is not so much about self-reflection, but about a way of looking at the world and questioning some of its central assumptions. The poem is called Indus 3180 Kilometers, which is the length of the river. The epigraph is from Ali Kuli Khan Khatak, who is a retired military general. We pushed them off a peak, then they push us off a peak, but nothing significant happened. In Hyderabad, the other one in Sindh, Pakistan. Omer strolls aimlessly into Giddu Park, then walks down the banks of the Indus, lowering his feet into the water and finds half lodged in sand a, sm a fruit, small and dark, like a custard apple, interfering with sunlight. Curious, school had closed for the summer, there was nothing to do. He dips his hand into the river. Two. In Siachen, not in Pakistan, not in any country, but in snow where borders fall through crevices, Vijay walks back to the camp after his daily training, the evening ice wind whipping his face, a file of soldiers behind him. He reaches in his backpack for a photograph taken a few months after they had met. He and Rima, only 22, their eyes roses, feigning casualness against the fake snow-capped mountains of a photo studio in Bareilly. The past gathers like frost around him. He remembers a friend in his regiment, long gone back to the plains, I will carry the mountains back with me as a kind of inability, he had said. People have to speak slowly to me now, like when they give me their phone numbers, I take time, I have to think, zero, what is zero? The doctors call it cerebral edema, he said. There is no oxygen here. Vijay then wanted to give him all the air his own lungs held, and with this the memory struck. Today, Vijay finds his backpack heavier than ever before, eating into his shoulders. What is zero? he asks. Why are the battles of the people of the plains always fought in the mountains? Now, he feels the bluish-white press around him, the color of burning sulfur is bluish white. The color of hell is burning sulfur. And all passion now, he unloads his equipment into the deep crevice, first the pickaxe, then some ammunition shells, lightening the war one by one, the soldiers behind him approaching quickly to keep him from harm, to hold him down. He throws three cans of extra protein biscuits, one fuel container, and when his bag is empty of almost everything, save Rima and him, rose-like, in the studio in Bareilly, he throws at last into the gaping glacier one grenade, small and dark, 
like a custard apple as the light begins to fade. Thank you. Maybe we can close it there. Yeah, I think maybe we can open it up to questions from anybody in the audience, anything you want to share or ask or talk to Akhil about in the context of queer poetry. Uh, and there's no incomplete thought. So even if it is half-baked, just ask. Thanks for the lovely session. So I was uh, wondering on, as you were reading and you were chatting, I was wondering on uh, poetry as a form itself, you know, and um, its relationship to the idea of resistance and invisibility. Because it, it in itself as a form of literature, I mean, if I have to get very simplistic, I will call no the novels heteronormative, mm. you know. So I was just wondering if you could reflect on that a little. The novel is heteronormative. Uh, that would give sleepless night to many novelists who I know. But, uh, but to think a little seriously about what you're saying, you know, there is, for instance, you know, Suveer Kaul has written quite articulately about this in his book called Of Gardens and Graves. And he's really trying to solve the riddle. And he's someone who studies a Kashmiri literature extensively. He's trying to solve the riddle that there is a variety of genres of literature, whether it's, let's say, non-fiction, particularly reportage, newspaper reportage, or long-form non-fiction, or prose fiction, which does not seem to have been able to escape censorship has not quite had the same experience which poetry has had, which even sometimes the state bodies, uh, whether it's the Sahit Academies of a particular state or even the Central Sahit Academy, has actively pursued and published that there's something about poetry, perhaps because it indulges and works with image and metaphor and with also a sense of indirection often and not kind of concreteness, it has been able to elude protocols of censorship which no other form uh, has been able to. And also the other reason is that almost like, I mean, this is the conventional definition of poetry. You know, it is interested in your interior life. It is interested in your emotional life. It is interested in how this person saw something at a particular intersection of time and space in that particular moment. You know, uh, Safu is looking at her lover speaking to another man and she gets jealous. That is an iconic moment of lyric poetry. Or... Um, Kolatkar goes to this pilgrimage town in Jejuri near Pune and he sees uh, a small puppy uh, uh, in a deserted temple. And for him at that moment, that puppy is far more important than the most than the presiding deity of this pilgrim town. So maybe because poetry gives importance to the mundane, maybe because poetry gives importance to the everyday, maybe because poetry says that the smallest experience which you might have had is important affectively and move and can move the world. Perhaps that's why you are interested in claiming for poetry that which you're not interested in claiming for uh, prose fiction or certainly non-fiction. But having said that, the caveat over there is often you will be also see prose fiction described as quote-unquote poetic. And when we say, oh, let's say someone will say, oh, her prose is poetic. And what that means is it inhabits a certain intensity and it inhabits a certain way of distributing attention and scrutiny that we usually identify with poetry, right? So in, at that point, I think the lines blur. And I think at that point, no matter how much of an exceptionalist position one might want for poetry, uh, one one will deter from making that claim. Uh, maybe Aditi was also a poet that I have long admired. Maybe you'd like to engage with that as well, if you want. Yeah, I'm just thinking about how I feel like poetry is also something that I associate more with, for example, a protest. Like there's very few things that there's also musicality to poetry and there's a chant quality to poetry. And I think there's, I remember in the early years when uh, we became friends and I would, I always thought it was really interesting how many protests you were reading at, right? So, and not all of them were pride. I mean, there was pride, but there was also like your poem about the Marathi Workers Union, and right? So I think there's a way in which there's a rallying around the spoken word component of poetry and the musicality of poetry, right? Like even uh, when we were at Pride this year, I was remembering uh, pre-decriminalization, the, the chant, which I think you had initially coined that used to be there at Pride, Gonsa Kanun Sabse Batter, Teen Sa Satatar, Teen Sa Satatar, right? There is a, 
there is something about that musicality that creates or allows community in a way that I don't know of a parallel to in prose. And I wonder if that's part of also that moment of poetry being able to resist something or to speak for something um, in, a, in a sort of very specific way. I mean, in retrospect, Konsa Kanun Sabse Battar 377 might be an over exaggeration. I can think of a few <laughs> laws which are far worse than it, but it's also that moment in your life, no, where that thing seems to be allegedly pinching you the most. Uh, but, you know, I've always thought about this kind of peculiar uh, coincidence and not so much coincidence as we'll soon realize of in the Indian subcontinent, so many uh, politicians being poets, no? So, and my own city, Lucknow, seemed to have sent one as the prime minister in some of your lifetimes, if not everyone's, Atal Vihari Vajpayee, who was a poet. Several others, though, you know, Kumar Vishwas, who was early in the Aam Aadmi Party, a poet. Uh, and whether you like it or not, Kapil Sibyl in the Congress Party, a poet. And if you don't remember, two, with two published volumes of poetry in translation from Gujarati, a very prime minister is also a poet. And his latest poem on the Garba again went viral uh, for one, for better or for worse. So now... And I'm just thinking this might not be a coincidence because both of them are tools of persuasion. Both of them, whether it's a politician rallying around someone's to one's point of view or to one's ideological way of looking at the world, or whether it's poetry which is trying to create a certain lyric spell through certain uh, modes of using sound and sense and space, uh, creating certain networks of refrains and rhymes, that both of them participate in the rhetorics of persuasion. And in that sense, I think poetry, short form, peculiarly mobile, uh, ability to travel far and wide, or far more oral than other forms of literature, so does not, does not depend on the literacy of the wider masses, uh, is able to do what other forms and genres have not been able to do. I mean, think of Lok Shahir, think of the Ambedkarite movement and the role that poetry has also played in that context. And it tells us that the in that sense, I think the the mobility of poetry is far greater than other forms. Okay, so it's always um, great to hear you speak. So thank you for this evening. Um, thank you for the poems. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, what you talked about initially, that um, the queerness being um, the specific kind of queerness that, um, you know, people seem to be looking for even while interacting with queer people, you know, that what makes you queer and then what makes your work queer and then um you know recently i was submitting to an anthology and um, the the theme was you know feminist writing from the northeast so like i belong to the northeast and then you know they asked me for my bio and everything and then um also it wasn't specified and then you know there are other uh, publications that I keep submitting to and then sometimes it's queer poetry or like it's feminist poetry or you know all these categories that we place ourselves in and then you know this this question always like keeps coming back to me as like a very conflicting sort of situation that you know if is all the poetry that I might you know write how is that can that be considered as queer and then you know what um, what part of me Will the queerness be a part of everything that I am a part of? And then is that going to affect that, you know, everything that I'm going to write? Or is that going to be a separate part of me that will, again, have certain, um, you know, factors that will be used to measure it? Like how much of a queer person that I am and then how much of queerness is reflected through my writing. So that is always something that I have, like, um, you know, like, like there is this questioning that comes keeps coming back to me, and then like you said, I think I found it like very interesting that, you know, because queerness as um queer queer people as just a form a, a way of being, because it falls outside of that ambit of very stringent heteropatriarchal, you know, structures, then it is the very structures which constantly keep, you know. Uh, troubling you and it is against those structures that you keep writing so whether it is the capitalist whether it is against the 
Islamophobic tendencies or uh, it, it is against the xenophobic, the homophobic, all sorts of narrow, very, the mainstream, the, um, you know, stringent sort of definitions that the society particularly wants everybody to be under. It is against those structures that I think it just starts reflecting in queer poetry that you have this sort of resistance towards those structures that you keep writing against. And I think that is where the queerness is always going to show. So it does not have to be, you know, uh, under the ambit of desire and sexuality that it always comes against. But I agree. Yeah. Yeah. You were completing. With yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I think, like, um, this makes like a lot of sense. But then, yeah, like, it's always um, even while like, you know, while producing that work, I think that conflict like keeps coming back, but then this is like a very, um, I think, a good way to think about it and go through it. Uh, I completely agree with you. I'll give you two very small examples and I'll be brief. You know, when we were editing the anthology, Fatima Ashkar, for instance, gave us a poem which was called, now this is a queer anthology, and Fatima Ashkar gave us a poem called Pluto Shits on the Universe. And Pluto Shits on the Universe is really about, you know, erstwhile planetary body which was demoted from the status of being a planet and that demotion, those who fail or those who are demoted from a larger tropes and celebrated status of cultural life, what do they have to say about the world? And it goes on, it's, it's written in the first person as if Pluto is speaking and Pluto is giving his two cents to the universe very volubly and very with a great, num great amount of swag. At that point, queerness has already transformed from being simply a thing about body and uh, affection. It has transformed into a worldview a kind of stance that you have towards the world, a kind of disposition that you have my, towards the world. And that is the kind of, that is the arc that you also seem to be drawing for us. Or the, uh, I'll give you another small example of a Gujarati, Hindi and English poet called Dhiren Borisa, and uh, uh, also a friend of mine. And when they submitted a poem for the collection, uh, the same queer anthology, they sent us a poem which was in that year addressed and they were writing as a, queer Dalit man and they address that poem to Rohit Vemula and the poem goes like in one sense why does the burden of recounting all the names of people that we have lost fall on me right and at that point it's not for the anthologist to say hey this poem is about caste it's not about sexuality so it does not belong in a queer volume rather at that point the perspective needs to be no in the way that you have conceptualized queerness it includes the question of a kind of caste friction which you are facing with the world as an important and salient dimension of your queerness and which is why it does belong to this anthology as any other poem which might be about love, loss, desire uh, in this particular volume. So, which tells me in the way that you are also designing the this small arc in the way you are submitting poems, uh, that can be traced even the way we were also shaken out of some of our narrow definitions of what queer could be and what queerness is, rather than an embodied thing, also a thing of disposition, worldview, stance, ways of looking at the world. Yeah. There was another question at the back, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for all the poems and just this experience. It was beautiful listening to you. Um, I think part of my question was already answered in the last question. But uh, like you said, that queerness actually doesn't just or isn't just supposed to be or hasn't come out to be merely uh, one sexuality, but also extends to the worldview that we have. Generally speaking, the queer poetry that I have read and also my whole understanding of what queer poetry might have meant until now my, has actually changed after listening to you because it would mean a lot of other things. But a lot of queer poems that I have read, or generally a lot of queer experience, even for example when I come out to someone, uh, generally to people who are not queer in the strict sense of the word, um, the expectation is that every time I'll come out there will be a sob story that follows, right? Because a lot of queer experience is very sad, it's sad and it's you know filled with a lot of childhood trauma and this, that, the other, right? All of, most of which is generally not very happy. So a queer person, and I hope that I'm not saying this in a way that limits other people's experiences, but just generally, I would want to understand that is there also queer poetry 
that is not sad or that does not, let's say, address the most difficult uh, issues that the world is currently facing, all of which I, I embrace. But just for my own, you know, understanding and experience, is there something that extends beyond the sad and the melancholy? You will be happy to know there is. <laughs> and uh, for instance, in our, in our volume itself, there are poems in which a sonneteer gets a heartbreaker's haircut. Uh, and that's a poem that she has written. Uh, there is a poem by, if I remember correctly, uh, called Meal Planning, in which two lovers design uh, and cook the most delicious meal for each other, at which point the meal becomes more than just eating, but in one sense a ways of engaging with each other's body as well. So there's, uh, and food is uh, something which goes in one's mouth, as several other things also do. So th th there's, there's joyous poem, there's G. Man Semela's resistance rap, in which that which otherwise we think of as uh, struggle and something which causes pathos is also a cause of celebration in that poem. So of course, like any person whose lives are a cluster of demanding and jo d experiences of demanding depth and experiences of joyous surface surfaciality, uh, it is reflected in this wide kind of umbrella of called queer poetry as well. But you know, there's thing about what you're calling the sad template of coming out and what you're calling the sub story. In one moment, it did serve a function. You know, there is a moment, if, I mean, at least if you look at not the subcontinent, but if you look at, let's say, Western European and American literature, there is a moment from the late 1970s till about early 2000s where there's a glut in the market of the coming out story. Because it seemed to be important at that stage of the queer movement, it seemed to be important for that story to furnish the marketplace and to populate what is what people needed to hear. But already when in one sense, the degree of acceptance of certain kinds of queer lives, not all kinds of queer lives, but certain kinds of queer lives became more and more ordinary. I mean, just a few days back, that quote-unquote Billy Eilish is coming out or no, as a non-coming out was discussed in the sense it seems so ordinary, thinking about desires for other women. As that became, as queerness became more ordinary, the coming out story also seemed to be disappearing from the marketplace. So in that sense, it was a template, but it was a historically exigent template, and the template does not, uh, it will not necessarily always live through. When the shoe stops pinching you, the story will also disappear, right? And at that point, it will acquire some other form. So, uh, so sadness is not the only signal queerness is sending it out into the world, but nonetheless, I'm also suspicious of a kind of hegemonic happiness. I'm also suspe uh, uh, suspicious of people who want to force a certain narrative of happiness alone, which you're not doing, but I'm just saying where a certain kind of narrative of pride, celebration, uh, is also then peculiarly unamenable to other kinds of people joining in who they see as spoiling the party. So I don't know if you read recent descriptions of pride and both the social media and the mainstream press commentary on it, this current pride, in which lots of people said, hey, why were these people talking about Palestine when all that we wanted to do is have a good time and go from your Lalit Hotel to Jantar Mantar and party through the way? And who are these people speaking about the G word, genocide? And I'm thinking that is an insistence on happiness which then excludes certain narratives. So I think uh, like several other things, the truth might be somewhere in the middle rather than insisting only on a form of happiness or a form of compulsory sadness and neither of them should be compulsory. Uh, we were just before this talking about, you know, also queer joy, right? And one of the things we were talking about was, for instance, friendship and how friendship and the ideas of chosen family and the ideas of who do you Akhil has this beautiful poem uh, called Who Will Take You to the Hospital When You Fall Down. And it's a poem that um, it starts with, I mean, the first, that's the title. And the first line is, is the only question my parents ask for which I have no answer. And I was uh, reminding him about when he first put that poem on social media. And as, as a friend who sees Akhil's family, I responded in that comment saying, I will. And then his mother liked that comment and there was a kind of conversation with his mother through that moment, right? And I think there is a kind of um, possibility for 
friendship as a central relationship in our lives, as a central theme of our lives, that is one of the great gifts of uh, the queer theory and the queer movements. And so in those ways, like, is a celebratory poem about having coffee with a friend, is it a queer joy poem? Actually, it is. But it may not always be seen as, right? So I think uh, for me, there's a way in which if we expand that, like, precisely to that idea of, like, the coming out story is one central crucial aspect of queer life, as are all these other things. And maybe because we often look at this more in regular mainstream ways of thinking about queerness, but how, um, I don't think you have time to actually read that translation you wanted to about friendship, but do you want to say anything? But I'll that? alert you to that. You sh- uh, like the poem that she's referring to is Wislava Simborska's Polish poet, uh, Wislava Simborska's A Thank You Note. And that poem is a thank you note, not for people who hold romantic significance in one's life, but for one's friends. And unlike the exaggerated fantasies and betrayals of those who are our lovers, uh, she speaks of friends as those who keep us grounded and those who have a, who keep us in a three-dimensional world, with whom a picnic and a church trip and a, 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 a stroll is just a picnic and a church trip and a stroll, rather than meaning more or less and being hesitant or doubtful about what the intentions of the other person are. So I think the larger point which Aditi is also making is that there is a way in which queer lives have placed a premium on friendship as some of the central relationship, which I see in so many lives around me, including mine uh, and Aditi's, that that is a different form of even organizing your relationships in the world. Rather than necessarily that when you don't get married, you should all be able to do this. I think queerness questions both the intensity of your friendships and the durability of your friendships, which otherwise heterosexual marriage says, okay, now no longer and not so much. That those two limits, I think, come up for question. And I mean, there are friends in my life, one sitting on the stage who have played that very crucial role in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Arjun. And my question is about the word queer. When I googled it, it gave the definition of something like uh, something which is strange, something which is odd. So my question is, uh, could you share something about the history of this word? Why was this word chosen to represent this section of the community? And now, over the past few years, since this uh, LGBTQ movement has gained traction, should we rep- should we refer to this community with some other word which does not mean strange and odd? Oh, but why not? Strange and odd. Because, you know, the oldest, I mean, one of the etymological roots of the word queer, one of the instances is from kind of uh, medieval English author Chaucer. In that, he is using the mnemonic queer for everyone. In the sense that everyone has some kind of strangeness and some kind of eccentricity. And so there's nobody as queer as folk, he says in old English, kind of. Uh, But... Even till the 19th century, you will see the word queer is not only used for some kind of sexual minority, but it is used for a variety of people who fall outside the pale of social acceptance. So you will notice night women, uh, sex workers of sorts, in the 19th century streets of London will be described as queer, right? And uh, But this is also around the time, and this towards the late 19th century, where something called the homosexual was being invented, where... Uh, certain kinds of desire, certain kinds of bodily comportment, certain kinds of uh, 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 characteristic and features of bodies were beginning to be called homosexual. And the word queer began to be attached not just now to anyone who falls outside the pale of acceptance, but only to some people. But as I mentioned right in the beginning, in the answer to the first question, by the 70s, the feminist and the queer movement was already changing this association. It was again bringing that wider rubric, that wider definition, saying, no, actually, there's a lot to be gained from the fact that queer people are not just LGBT, but queerness might be anyone who occupies some kind of friction with the accepted mainstream. And one of the earliest instances, for instance, you know, the first group which filed a legal complaint, a legal redressal against Section 377, uh, was this group in early 90s called AIDS Bhedbha Virodhi Andolan, Abva. And Abva, and there's a very famous photograph of it, which some of you might have seen, of the first protest that they held outside the Delhi police uh, ITO headquarters, uh, challenging the harassment that the police uh, uh, gave them in their anti-AIDS uh, work. Uh, uh, 
in that protest if you look at the photographs the child rights groups are there the feminist groups are there uh the queer groups are there those who very much think of themselves as gay men are there so you see a wide variety of people joining in and becoming in that sense in now in the history that moment is recorded as a and i've often seen it on people's status messages and in kind of mini histories that people build i've often seen that as being recalled delhi's first queer protest that might not be true but in that recalling in that fantasy again queerness is able to hold oddness strangeness which otherwise might on the surface appear as a strange marker to us actually is able to hold an inclusive solidarity among people which just gay or just lesbian might not be able to do so no i think there's a there's something to be gained from that uh feature of oddness in the word rather than for that to be now distinguished and of course there's a long history of various kinds of social movements to uh appropriate the words which otherwise have been used as slurs against them if you look at ginni mahi's chamar pop in punjabi uh, music that's what's happening uh how to how she uses the word which otherwise is cast in vective but for her uh, is pride or if you look at the way african american communities might use the n word among themselves uh so then even if queer might have a kind of salacious or a, what according to you might have been a bad connotation at some point of time once appropriated it is being utilized in a different manner right so there's no so there's something to be gained there i don't know i was just responding to the sad thing because there was a moment in my life i was where i was always asking why are feminists always shown so angry so i was uh, you know when i was growing up and i would be where is the happy feminist you know and where is the why are they all sad you know and um, and you know it was very similar to what you just thought and i i'm wondering if there is something evolutionary in this whole parabolic path of a movement you know because it has even the caste movement has seen that you know where you need that identification of a happy caste story yeah and at the same time black feminists are writing about that today that we don't want to see mutilated faces and guns only we also want to see the success stories and all that so i mean i i engage with that question and i am also saying that journey is also maybe you know part of the narrative in a certain way thank you um so we'll draw to a close akhil maybe you want to read the poem you wanted to close with that kind of brings together this queerness as identity and queerness as world view i mean uh, there we have been aditi and i and all of us now have been talking about what it might be for queerness to be this embodied experience with some bodies experience and for it to be a world view which can be partaken and shared by everybody and i wanted to close with this poem it's called the last time i saw you because it brings together two stories one which is very explicitly uh, a candidate for something called queer poetry but other which is usually not thought to be belonging to that fold this poem was uh, the last time i saw someone who was deeply significant in my life was also the day when when coming back to my home literally perpendicular to i was moving across the ring road near lajpat nagar and moving across from my route was that large exodus of uh, migrant laborers during the pandemic lockdown who were leaving through the i mean crossing the yamuna and then going to the different towns of uttar pradesh bihar madhya pradesh some people crossing uh, thousands of kilometers in that journey and i was in this poem just trying to make sense of a moment obviously of a very small personal loss but no matter how small your losses are the fact that you experience them makes them pinch you to this kind of enormous canvas of loss which i was seeing around me so maybe i'll just close with this poem and then and uh thank you for each of your questions as well the last time i saw you i woke you up to say a little goodbye you were half asleep i kissed you and left I don't remember what you had murmured it could have been are you sure I was leaving very early the sun had not risen yet I don't remember my reply you were half naked I kissed you and left imagine imagine the first door in the world that was knocked imagine the reply of someone sitting inside 
surprised by a small door now animate with arrival if i knew this was the last time what would i have said how long would i have waited what crumbs would i have left keeping all those possible sentences in my arms i leave to be then on and then on perpetually surprised by this morning by the simplicity of the going i don't remember the color of that fateful sky as i climb down your steps i decide to walk back to mine only 4 kilometers away the morning held fast the city was folding inwards hardly anyone out in the neighborhood no morning walkers no car cleaners no women rushing to keep the morning rituals of other people except a gray stillness quietly spreading the month of the sudden long lockdown i walked down not knowing it was the last time sentences still falling from my arms each one a possibility the city could not realize i walk there is no catch in the promise of this morning holding fast to a growing quiet i leave behind all the hours we could have spent all the corners we could have hushed into signs i reach the ring road as i cross into my neighborhood i see a long quiet file of people heading towards the river and then from the foot over bridge it is visible outwards and then outwards people leaving the city in a slow deliberate step i see them from far keep walking the slowness was key they knew the enormity of the task at hand at one point i cut across their file they have no business with those whose homes are near they keep walking the same slow stride of a final pledge each promise is broken each hand is taken back they keep walking the gray ash fault is slowly slowly shaken black they keep walking i reach my side of the road and for once look back they keep walking they are going away suddenly unhomed their steps making out the shape of a large abandonment imagine the first city in the world that was deserted imagine the sounds that the exiles took away with them that city will always live in the crumbs of those silences we've been abandoned in the middle of nowhere a man said to the camera expecting the world expecting nothing does a thing change when you see it for the last time does it stop answering already once it is behind your back i am near my home the tree is losing its sap the city is losing its people each branch is being sapped the hours we could have spent now lie indifferent in the nearness of our homes i reach already behind my back a future has stopped answering as i climb to my door you are already becoming the shape that cannot be touched a breach in the gray distance you are already attenuating the stories that could be told now each one ends in the middle of nowhere this city is becoming a thing that no one will recognize each step is irreversible no crumbs to lay behind once final going if we abandon this damn city it would starve a man says to the camera the city is starving of its people they are far now too far already across the river you are far now too far without me knowing the breath of this morning's capacity to empty everything i open my door and enter in a quick unguarded step a new abandonment thank you thank you akhil um thanks everybody and big thank you to suitable agency and sundar nursery for hosting us and prompting this lovely conversation um uh thanks to amber and himali and priyanka and everyone at a suitable agency for calling us and aditi and i really enjoyed this conversation and thank you to all of you who came here and interacted with us I, it means a great deal thank you